very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. Thank you very, very much to Lindy Tennant-Brown for playing so beautifully. <laughs> That was Richard Strauss's Morgan, and tomorrow the sun will shine once more. My name's Elizabeth Meister, and I've come to talk to you today about the beauty of the human voice. Over the next few minutes, I'll be uh, demonstrating how, well, I've just done that a bit, but how, demonstrating how the vocal mechanism works. Uh, I'll be giving you a brief history of the human voice, and I'll be sharing with you why I think singing is so important to us as a culture. I'm going to start by introducing you to a set of vocal cords. Here are my vocal cords. I'll just explain what you're seeing there. So the camera was going up my nose and down my throat. So uh, the bottom of the picture you see uh, is the front of my throat and the top of the picture is the back of the throat, so everything's a little bit reversed. Um, on the left, you can see my vocal cords in that sort of V shape. Can you see that V position? That's the open, so my vocal cords were open. I was perhaps just breathing or not speaking. And on the left-hand side, you can see them in the closed position. But how do we make sound with our voices? So <laughs> I'll just explain. Um, air passes up from the lungs through the vocal cords. And if you imagine these are my vocal cords, if you imagine this is the bottom and this is the top. So the air comes up through the vocal cords and it creates a gap at the bottom, allowing a little puff of air to travel upwards. And it's always in this upward direction. And these puffs of air travel very, very quickly, uh, creating sound. And then these sounds are regulated and uh, turned into words with the use of the tongue and the teeth and the lips. And the pitches of these sounds are regulated by the lengthening and shortening of the vocal cords. So the longer the vocal cords are stretched, the thinner they become, a bit like an elastic band, um, and the shorter, then the lower. So I'll just demonstrate. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, my vocal cords aren't that long, and they don't stretch that long. I'll just show you, just to give you a sense of perspective, that these vocal cords are about the same length in diameter as a five-pence piece in a woman. And in a man, just in case there's anybody here with any size issues, your vocal cords, men, are about the same length in diameter as a ten-pence piece. Well done. <laughs> That's enough of that, I think. So I've been uh, singing professionally for about 20 years now, and opera is my chosen field. Um, opera itself goes back several centuries, uh, more than 500 years. But professional singing goes back way before then, and in fact, I've got a picture here. I should keep this in my hand. Uh, I've got a picture here of uh, a tombstone dating back to 2424 BC. And this lady here on the right uh, is called E.T., and you can see her gesturing towards her harpist accompanist with her right hand and holding her left hand up to her ear so that she can hear herself more clearly. Um, that's the way that uh, the professional singers were depicted uh, in uh, Egyptian pictures. But speech and language goes back way beyond 2424 BC. Uh, research suggests that uh, about 100,000 years ago, is when uh, our brains began to develop and grow and were able to cope with the concept of speech and language. But what were we doing before that? A hundred thousand years before that, we were, we were using our voices to communicate and to create emotion or to, to show emotion and to create empathy and to communicate with one another. So we've spent 200,000 years using our voices to communicate with one another. And I think that's quite an astounding statistic. I'm going to tell you a story now to, uh, to highlight how our voices create empathy. About two and a half years ago, I was invited to a party given by a friend of mine called Barry. 
and it was in his hospice where he was spending the last few months of his life. And Abari knew that uh, <clears throat> he knew that he wasn't going to make it to his 60th birthday, and so he decided to throw what he called his thank you and good night party, and uh, he invited about 90 or 100 of his friends to come along, and uh, he asked if I would please come along and sing a few songs and arias that held special meaning for us both over the course of our friendship. And one of those songs was that glorious one from Carousel, You'll Never Walk Alone. Any Liverpool fans in, you obviously know how it goes, everybody else. When you walk through the storm, keep your head up high. You know that one. In the days leading up to the party, um, I was practicing this song and I couldn't get more than a few bars into it uh, without breaking down and crying. And I thought, well, this is going to be a bit of a disaster. If I turn up to the party, start singing, start crying, you know, this is all about Barry, this isn't about me. And, uh, and so I thought, I need to devise a cunning plan. And this cunning plan involved me gesturing to the audience at the point where I thought I couldn't continue anymore. And then everybody could join in, and then I could drop out, and the situation would be saved, disaster averted, and, you know, what a clever little girl I am. Well, it didn't turn out quite like that. I turned up at the party, and there was Barry, sitting in the front row. And, uh, and his, uh, his friends were in the, just standing behind him. <clears throat> and I started to sing. And... Um, excuse me, a bit like now, I felt this lump in my throat, and I felt my eyes prickling, and I thought, okay, I need to go to Operation Baldrick now. <laughs> and so I, so I gestured to the audience, and I got them to join in, and for about a nanosecond, I thought the plan had worked. Um, everybody started singing, but what was happening at that moment was suddenly 200,000 years of vocal evolution came crashing into the party, Everybody started empathizing with me, and they could hear that I was in vocal difficulty. They started getting a lump in their throat. They all started crying. <laughs> Disaster not quite averted, but you know, it was quite a memorable occasion. <laughs> Dr. Annie Patel of the Neurosciences Institute in San Diego puts it really well, I think, when he says, we feel music just taps into this kind of precognitive archaic part of ourselves. And it's this precognitive ability to emote and to empathize with each other that I think brings us together as a species. And this is why we sing together. It's why we go to football matches. It's why we sing You'll Never Walk Alone. It's why we sing Happy Birthday. It's why we sing uh, hymns in churches at weddings and funerals. It's why we go to pop concerts to listen to our favorite singers. And it doesn't matter whether you're a trained singer, it doesn't matter whether you're Pavarotti, or whether you're Louis Armstrong, or whether you're Bob Dylan, or whether you're George Michael singing in the shower. The fact is that singing brings us all together as a species, and it forms that unbreakable bond of communication. And I think that is the real beauty of the human voice.